Hey Pathfinders, our book has finally arrived. The Pathfinder's Journey is live on Amazon right now and ready for you. If you have already purchased our book and or left us a review, we thank you endlessly. If you haven't, what are you waiting for? The ebook sale of 99 cents won't last long, so head over to Amazon today to get your copy. Be sure to download the free 7-day reading journal to make your journey even more worthwhile. Well, that's all for now. Check out the link in the show notes to get your copy of The Pathfinder's Journey today. Enjoy the show. We sat down. I remember so vividly we were sitting at our fire pit and we were I had my laptop. We were talking through looking at things and I looked at Eric and said, you know, we could make this our life and we could travel and live this very dream life that we didn't think was possible. Welcome to the On Purpose Investor Podcast with your host, Eric and Tiffany Vogel. We spent several hard years building a rental property portfolio so we could have more time with our family and live our ideal life. Finding your path can be difficult, so we're here to help guide you along the way with lessons, tips, and tricks to design and implement your dream life through real estate investing. Now sit back, turn up the volume, and get ready for this episode of the On Purpose Investor. Hey, Pathfinders. Welcome back to the On Purpose Investor podcast. Your host, Eric. And Tiffany. Great to have you back. We uh, all took about a month off. And in that time, we have been working really diligently on preparing this season for you, as well as uh, getting the book a little more in line to launch uh, later this summer. So we're really excited to be bringing that to you in just a few months. This season, we're going to walk through some uh, different uh, things than we did last season. Last season, we focused a lot on mindset and, you know, getting your mind in the right spot to to invest and to change your life. And this season, we're going to get a little bit more into the nuts and bolts and sharing a little bit of our experience of others around us and try to give you a little bit more tactics so that you can start moving forward in your journey. Yeah. So this season, we're going to start this episode off with our story and how we got started and some of the things we experienced in our career. So just kind of an overview of what we've done and our backgrounds. And then we're going to alternate with kind of a lesson similar to what we did last season. And then the alternative episodes, so every other week, it will be um, more of a deep dive into the tactics that we used in our business and talking about some specific deals and properties that we own or have worked on. That's right. So we'll kick this off by kind of walking backwards from from the very start of it. Talk a little bit about my background. I grew up in a blue collar family. Uh, Dad was a heavy diesel mechanic and mom worked intermittently at the schools or at convenience stores. And, you know, she, she worked here and there to take up time, but dad was the breadwinner. You and know. she had four kids. So let's right. add that she was doing a lot in the house also. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, growing up, there wasn't a lot of money education talks. There was never discussions on, you know, utilizing credit or not saving money. It was always uh, feast or famine on when dad got his paycheck. That's usually, you know, I remember in my adolescence years of when I first got a car and, you know, gas money was a thing and we had to have gas money. We would only get, you know, a $20 bill like every other week. This is your gas money and whatever you need it for. Go figure it out. And I would, you know, always try to turn that into I'm getting to work with that money. And I'm going to try to put a little bit more gas in my tank so I can go around and do the other things I want to do. But, you know, money and financial literacy was lacking in my house. And so it was one of those things that really didn't set me up to be successful when it comes to how I spent money. And I remember talking in a past episode how I would get a W-9 and whatever it is, the tax form you get to show you how much you made that year. And I'd file it with, you know, H&R Block and say, wow, you made, you know, $40,000 last year. And I'd really have nothing to show for it, uh, with the exception of having maybe a car payment and a rent or a house payment. I didn't really have a lot to show for it. I know when I met Tiffany, we kind of, she kind of whooped me into shape a little bit about, you know, tracking money, utilizing it in the best ways possible. And, and this was before we became investors. Uh, she said, hey, you don't really uh, spend your money in the best ways. And you're, you're throwing a lot of money away on different subscriptions, on, on different things, uh, stopping at gas stations and you getting know. a bagel at Dunkin Donuts when you could just make a bagel at home or at work. Yeah. And I was just very flippant. Yeah. When it came to spending money, if you know if I had it, I spent it. 
And that's how I grew up. If we had it, we spent it. And so Tiffany kind of interrupted my life in a good way, utilizing my money uh, in a better way. You know, going through high school, I had no plans after high school, uh, really, other than, you know, I wanted to get out of the house and and start doing my own thing. But uh, my band director, uh, he kind of pushed me uh, to go to college and said, Eric, you have a talent, you have a gift uh, with, with music, and you should consider being a music educator. And I really didn't think anything about it. I just kind of let him tell me what I was good at and called the School of Music at Georgia State. And they said, well, we have auditions next week for, for tubas. And I played the tuba and I set it up. I went up there the next week. I played and it was it was all very last minute. Well, and you had to go get an SAT done because yeah, you didn't so, have... Yeah, so, well, so the way it all played out, I it was like March or April of my gradu- graduation year, and I went up and played my audition, and I got accepted into the School of Music, and I got a scholarship, and the instructors up there were like, so uh, submit your SAT scores and all that, and I was like, I don't have an SAT. And so it was all, it was all very, very last minute. Went and took the SAT, scraped by, got in. <laughs> And, and got uh, financial aid uh, all set up. I barely made it into college. But, you know, I made it in somehow. And, you know, fast forward a couple of years into college and, you know, I'm out of money. I've, I've blown all of my scholarship dollars on fraternity fund and I needed some money and I needed some health insurance. So I decided to join the Army National Guard when I was in college. I was two years into college and had no real steady source of insurance. And I didn't really have a lot going on for me other than just going to school. And so I auditioned for the National Guard band. And uh, after a few attempts, I made it in. That's why I joined the National Guard Well, in college was to, to help get those things. And then, you know, that progressed and finished college and started my career as a band director. Yeah. And when you were working as a band director, you were investing everything into your band program. I mean, you would, it was not just a typical teacher schedule. Um, not that a typical teacher schedule is a light thing anyways, but you would go to work and you would, you always had morning duty, which I never understood. You had to get to work early to help get kids off the bus and handle all of that. Then you would have your normal school day, which would end at what, three something? Between 2.30 and four, depending on what school I was at. So then you would have in the fall band practice after most days of the week. And it would run till about six o'clock in the evening. Right. So you were working a solid 12 hour days for the most part, because you still had to to wait for the last kid to go home. Right. So you were working 12 hour days. And then your Fridays, you had a football game in the fall. The school you were at at the end when we met was a really good football team. So football games didn't end until January. Right. So that was half the school year. And then competitions during marching band season, all day Saturday. So that was another 12 to 15 hour day. Right. So you had Sundays off. You were way overworked. Mm Mm-hmm. And we, you decided also in the spring to do like an indoor band competition. Yeah, it was just a, a very involved job. Yes. And, and it took a lot of time. Um, and, you know, the better part of me says, you know, it was so worth it. And it was. There are so many students that, that I came across that just, you know, if it wasn't for band, you know, it's uncertain where their lives would go right. because it just gave them a place to be and belong. And that's what it was for me right. growing up. And I was happy to provide that for others. But at the end of the day, I was doing very little to invest in, in myself right? and very little to invest in what my future family needed and what I wanted for my future right. family. I mean, I remember you coming home and just being so mentally and physically and emotionally drained that you wanted to go sit in the corner by yourself. And I had spent the whole day working in the home office, so I needed interaction and people. And yeah. it was really a hard a hard place for us because right. neither of our needs were being met because we were just so drained all the time from our jobs. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's a little bit about my background before we started investing. Uh, Tiffany, let's hear about yeah. yours. Yeah. I grew up very different from Eric. Um, I think we had a 3,500 square foot house. My, I have one brother and a stepsister and, you know, I had my own bathroom. Eric shared with his all Three his siblings. siblings. Yeah. So we had stairs in our house, which was a big deal for Eric. That uh, Stairs inside of a house. That's that's when you've made it. That's rich, rich. Yes. <laughs> um, and for us, like money was talked about. We received an allowance, which was equal to our age. Um, and half of it was deposited into a savings account each week. So we would get 
some put in our savings account and then the alternating week we'd get whatever our age was. But for me at 16, $16 every two weeks was not enough to do what I wanted to do. So I got a job at 15, um, working at the Outback as a host and worked my way up through there. So there was definitely an emphasis on working for what we wanted. We really didn't get a lot handed to us, but there was, I guess, work ethic was really taught and we were taught to save. So with that money that was set aside in my savings account, it was invested in the stock market. Um, Home Depot and Coke in particular were the, I guess, two Atlanta companies my parents, I guess I chose, but my parents helped me invest in. And I was able to cash that out along with some of my savings from my my work. And I bought my first car with cash um, when I was in college, my freshman year. And my first car was $200 clunker that I picked up at a junkyard. And my dad taught me how to work on it. And yeah. gave me a Haynes manual and said, figure it out. And that's how I got to and from work when right. I was a kid. Yeah. I paid <laughs> eight, $9,000 for my car because I had saved it up through high school and cashed out that the stocks for it. And so money was definitely something that was talked about. It was talked about in, a, in the traditional sense of go to work, go to school, get a good job, work your butt off kind of thing. So our mindset has shifted a lot towards money over the last few years but I was taught don't use credit cards to fund things you can't afford and so I guess the polar opposite of kind of Eric's experience when it comes to money I did join enrollment in high school I went in my freshman year as a sophomore I had already been through college so I didn't have to take the SAT at the last minute because I had taken it to get into the the joint enrollment program. And I knew where I wanted to go probably a year before graduating. So I'm a planner. My life, I had planned out exactly what I wanted to do. I got an internship my last semester that turned into a full-time job that I started working before I graduated. So I was, I, I guess, a lot more organized than I would say Eric was, especially when it came to college. I got a degree in finance, never actually worked in a finance department, but stayed with the same company for 11 years, got my master's, and kind of found myself not enjoying the work I was doing. I was traveling a lot, and I really didn't want to. And there was an expectation at one point in my career that I would be in the office at certain times and for certain hours. And we had Skype on our computer. So if you were away from your desk, it would show and people were just monitoring us like hawks. I had my timer on Skype set to for an hour. So every 55 minutes, I had an alarm go off on my phone to go move my mouse because it was just such a punch in, punch out kind of mentality instead of a get the work done mentality. And I had all of my work completed and then some, and I constantly was asking for more work and given busy work. So I stopped asking. So I just, I guess all of that to say, I was expected to work 12 hour days, but didn't have the work for myself to do 12 hour days. So just found myself really discontent and unhappy in my career. And for me, like I always wanted to be some form of a stay at home mom. I always, I knew I wanted to have work still, but I wanted the time freedom to spend with my kids. and that really was the drive for me to pursue real estate investing. And at one point, I was almost let go from a nine-year career with the company. I wound up doing a full 10 years. It was really an eye-opener for me of even though I've given them nine years, at any point, they can decide they no longer need me. And that's when we decided we really need to dig deep and figure out this investing thing so we can control our own destiny instead of relying on some employer and the whims of the the economy to decide if we have a job or not. Right. Well, you know, the birth of our company, of our rentals and of our investing career was totally happenstance. Uh, It was it was by it was by luck. I moved out of a house uh, in another town and tried to sell it, but couldn't because it was a VA loan, 0% down and had no equity in it. When I tried to sell it 11, 12 months later, yeah, the market wasn't that in 2017. So you I couldn't sell had, it. You would yeah. have to have written a big check to cover yeah. the agent costs and That's everything. Right. So I just didn't have the ability to sell it. And the, the agent that I had asked to sell my property recommended that I just rent it out. And so I called up an old buddy of mine that was a lawyer uh, from another town I lived in. 
And he drew me up this lease, and I put the property on Facebook, and I accepted kind of the first person that came around. And Did you, know, you read that lease in full before you rented it? I did not. Yeah. And I later found out that there was a stipulation in the lease that said, you shall fly no flags over the house except for the American flag and the Georgia Bulldogs flag. Because your attorney was a bulldog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I later, later read that. That was an interesting lease. Yes. But, you know... When I met Tiffany, she knew that I had this property because on our second date, she helped me move out of it. She knew I had this property and that I was renting it out, and she wasn't really involved in it until a little bit later when... We'd only been dating a few months at this point, mm -hmm. so I was not getting involved in all of your personal business. Right, right. She's, you know, she would ask about it, you know, how's that house down in LaGrange going? I'm like, oh, it's great. I have a great renter. You know, things are good. But I haven't then, collected the rent check for three months. Yeah, I was like, yeah, he's got my rent money on, the, on a shelf in the garage. I just need to go pick it up. And, you know, fast forward in our, in our lives about three or four months, and uh, Tiffany and I are spending a lot more time together, and she's asking a little bit more about this house, and she's like, there's got to be a better way to be a landlord so you can make it easier because, you know, you don't need to have to go down there all the time and pick up this rent money. There's got to be a way to automate that. I think we had a changeover in a tenant, and selecting a new tenant, I asked her for some help and well, we stumbled across bigger pockets. Yeah. Um, Tiffany did when she was researching. Yeah. I'm a big advocate in letting other people figure things out and following their systems and I guess their mistakes and learning from that. So I just started Googling and found this bigger pocket site and was like opened up to a whole new world of this is a thing. Like people do this. And my dad rented properties growing up. Oh eight hit him hard along with a divorce. And to me, it was a risky thing because it didn't work for him. But we were able to educate and find a way to make it work for us. Um, and we're, we're confident in our business at this point. But we sat down. I remember so vividly, we were sitting at our fire pit and we were, I had my laptop. We were talking through, looking at things. And I looked at Eric and said, you know, we could make this our life. And we could travel and live this very dream life that we didn't think was possible. And I could be home with kids and... I won't have to work the 12 to, you know, 16 hour right. days as a band director. And if I want to stay involved in music, you know, I could start some independent things in the future with all yeah. my free time that, that I'll have and, you know, the resources to do it right. and to, you know, to better reach the, the, the children and students that, that don't have financial means that, you know... We could open up this new life and, and provide and fulfill what drives us, right. but in a different way. And we wanted to be able to live for the seven days of the week, not for the weekends. And that's kind yeah. of where we were at that point. Yeah. We loved our Saturdays, but we wanted Saturday every day. That's right. So we dug deep. I remember we signed up for one of Brandon Turner's webinars and we, we casted it on the TV over the fireplace and sat mm -hmm. there all cozied up watching. And I remember you messaging him and I was so mortified that you were reaching out to this guy and, and he answered my question. Yes, he did. And, you know, looking back on it, they were such sweet questions yes. because they were just, we, we didn't know what we didn't know. And, and looking back, you know, the questions I ask, it's like, you know, that's what people need to know. If, if they are not real estate investors yet, or if, or if they're just getting started uh, on educating, those are the things that, that people need to know. Yeah. And that's something that I'm going to be putting into uh, a course that, that I'm going to be putting together for, for very, very newbie yeah. newbies, terminologies and right. stuff that to just help for you sure. get a grasp on it. Yeah. So we did this webinar and it was Brandon kind of giving an overview. And then he did a deep dive into a property. Like, like he asked a, for he a He was city, running a deal. Yeah. Right. So he just pulled up an address from Zillow and shows how he runs the numbers on it. And I'm very analytical. So I was like, oh, this is great. Like, let's do this. So that's when we started running numbers. I mean, when I had downtime at work, I would sit there and just run numbers. And, and she that would send way, me the houses that she liked the best. And when I would catch a break at school uh, while teaching, I would, I would go pull it up yeah. on my computer while teaching. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean, it, it kept me on Skype, so it looked like I was working. Right. So that worked out well for yeah, me. But we, we found a local meetup group through Bigger Pockets. Um, friend of ours, Mike Williams, who works with Brandon now, was posting it on the site. So we attended. And I remember I absolutely hated going. 
because I'm such an introvert and I was so unsure of myself. But we would go. Eric would always show up late because he was coming from across town and got off work later than I did. So I would I got there early, even though I didn't want to. And I would find someone to sit with and just question every time was, so what do you invest in? Are you a buy and hold? Are you a flipper? Like, what do you do? And that would just start the conversation. And I would learn what they were doing and explain that we were new. But we came Mm. every month. We did not miss for probably two years. And then you had drill and some things randomly came up here and there. But we were there every month. You know, something we heard at the meeting last night, um, they were echoing something that Bill Cook had said at at a different meeting in Atlanta. You know, if you want to be successful in anything, you have to immerse yourself. Yeah. And us go into this meeting every single month. You know, we have nothing going on. We don't have any rentals or, you know, we don't have any money to go buy properties, but we needed to immerse ourselves. And so we made that a huge priority. Yeah. So that we're going. We, we went to the meeting every month. Um, we listened to, I listened to podcasts nonstop. I listened to one on the way to work and one on the way back yeah. from work. I had, I had more bandwidth cause you can't really listen to podcasts while you're teaching, but I could while I was working yep. and I would go walk the neighborhood to get some exercise and listen to podcasts and I'd be doing dishes and listening to podcasts. It was, it was audio books and podcasts for yeah, me. Yeah. Information overload at times, but we really immersed ourselves. Mm-hmm. And you listened, or did you read Rhinoceros Success? I, I bought that book, okay. so I, I hand-read. <laughs> you actually read it. Yeah, I'm a big advocate for Audible, but you know that book was one I was like, I'm, I'm just going to buy it, and I'm going to force myself to read it, and I, I loved it. It, it. it thoroughly changed my life, yeah. and I, we have said it a lot over the podcast, but Rhinoceros, Rhinoceros Success is a huge yeah. a benefit for, for me personally right. and changing my mindset. Yeah, so we we gave up watching TV. We yeah we we eliminated everything right that wasn't. I think we we didn't even have a Netflix or anything. No, we, we canceled got, all of it because we needed every penny we could save to put yeah. into the houses. I had XM Radio at the time. Nick's that. Of course you did. Um, <laughs> we no, were we, analyzing deals. We would play cash flow. We would sit there, each of us on our laptops in the living room on the couch mm-hmm. together, and play cash flow against each other. And really for learn hours, that game. And hours and hours. So we we went all in. And we would analyze deals together, you know. Do you think we could make this work or what do you think the renovation costs are? Right. And then we started eventually we were like, let's find us a realtor and start looking at houses and we started going to look at yeah. houses. And that's where, you know, the the first step forward started being evident. Right. When we started looking at houses. Yeah. And when we invested Brandon and David on the podcast well, I guess it was Josh back then. Mm-hmm. So they were really advocating the Burr strategy or flip to rent. So it's buying a house, fixing it up, getting a tenant in place, doing a refinance and pulling as much cash out as possible and then repeating. So the idea is if you leave a small amount of cash in the house, um, you can use that sweat equity or the, the value you've added as your down payment to get that required amount for the lender because they usually only want to fund 70 to 75 percent of the loan. Mm-hmm. But you can do it without having to put in your own money. Right. Because we were in our mid to late 20s. So we didn't have equity in our house to tap into or we didn't have cash. Well, so so when we bought that first property, we didn't have a lot of cash. So we took loans on our 401ks and credit uh, cards. And we so we used the loans on our 401k to help take down the property. Uh, And what I mean by that is how we purchased the property. We have a family friend that was a financial partner with us that said, hey, I know you need some money to buy this property, but I'm not giving you a lot. You're going to have to put up a lot. Yeah. Because they wanted to be in first position. If we went bad on the note, they would own that property for less than half of it, what it was worth. So we put up like 40000 and our partner put up like 40000 We We had to put up a lot of money to get into that deal. And then we maxed out credit cards to renovate it. Yeah. And I I will say... That was the strategy we used. We are not advocating credit cards. We got 0% interest cards, and that floated us until we were able to do the refinance and pay it off. And we, when we did the refinance, we were able to pay off our family friend. We were able to pay our 401k loans back. And, and the credit cards. we were able to pay the credit cards right. off. And I don't but think it, we ended up leaving a ton of money in that home. In the first one? We yeah. left more than I think we had expected, um, but we actually recently did a second refi on it. 
and just pulled all of our capital out. We have a infinite cash on cash return on right. that property, but we we took a risk and we were okay with that risk because our salaries were sufficient enough to where we could live off my salary and your salary could go to pay off the credit cards right. if we had to. So that was a risk we were willing to take. That was a tool in our toolbox that was available to us. You have to look at what tools are available to you and what risks you're willing to take and your spouse is willing to take Mm -hmm. if you're married. So we were very aware of the risks. And to us, the risk of not making that move was a bigger risk than the risk we were taking on. So I just, I guess, want to put that disclaimer out there of use the tools available to you and the approach that works for you. I will say the BRRRR is not the best strategy in this market. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. But that's what worked for us at the time with the tools that we had. And the biggest tool that that I brought to the table was that I was handy enough to figure things out. Yeah. You and the school of YouTube. Yeah. So growing up, me and my dad did a lot of home renovation things together and we would figure things out together. You know, so I had the general knowledge of how to swing a hammer, how to use a screw gun, how to frame things, how to do drywall. I had very basic understanding of that stuff from growing up. And when we tackled this property, there were things that I had to do that I had no clue how to do it. And like Tiffany said, I went to the University of YouTube and I studied religiously. Mm-hmm. I gave everything I had to making sure I didn't only do it right, but that I did it, you know, legally. Right. Um, you know, because I added a whole bathroom. <laughs> I went and added a whole bathroom to this property yeah. where there was just a big laundry room. Right. And so I had to learn framing the new wall. I had to learn running electrical in there, running all the drain lines, running all the supply lines, making sure everything worked and was to code and was legal and and would withstand the you know the elements of time i was willing to face that challenge because of my skill set yeah because i was handy and so what i would do is i would go to work as a band director i'd work until five six o'clock at night and i would drive down to that project house and after spending all summer working on it too yeah so i spent all summer working on it and then the fall came up and i would that was my didn't know it was going to be my last year teaching but it was it ended up being my last year teaching, but that fall with marching band and football season and, and all of the ins and outs of, of band, I was at that house almost every single evening. You had uh, an air mattress and Pop Tarts and stuff for PB and J's. Yeah, and 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 I gave up so much yeah. to, to make that happen. And we both did. And, I mean right. I and, was almost single in some mm-hmm. ways. And Tiffany would come down there um, later on in the evenings and, and bring dinner some nights. Yeah. And she would swing a hammer, too. And she, <laughs> well, she did some drywall and... and she did some painting. The biggest thing is, is that while we weren't necessarily trained to do it, we figured it out because our why was so big that we wanted this. We wanted to live every day like it was a Saturday. Right. And we didn't want to just do that because we wanted to be lazy. We wanted to do that so that we'd have the time freedom to spend time with our future family and we wanted the financial freedom to never have to really worry about bills to to make sure we could do what we needed and wanted to do so i guess to recap we chose the burr method for our strategy because we were handy and willing to do some of the work ourselves Mm -hmm. we didn't have tons of money and capital to leave in a deal so doing 20% 20% down, we could have done that. We had the, the salary to where we could have done it, but it would have taken us a lot longer. Yeah. So we wanted to find ways that we could add value. So adding a bathroom, like our most recent property, we added a bedroom and a, converted a half bath to a full bath. Um, so every time we look at a house, we try to add some values, like appreciation mm-hmm. um, to the house so we can leave the least amount of cash in that deal as possible so we can keep going. So that was the strategy that worked for us at the time. We originally had planned that I would quit first because the thought was we would have kids and I would stay home. Yeah. But we realized you were working so many hours at the school that it was hard. My return on investment of my time. Your hourly rate. Yeah. It it was it was a lot less than yours. Right. You know, you you could work a standard eight hour day. And still and, and and still do the what your lane was. Yes. You could still run deals. You could still right. analyze. I deals. could use my lunch break to to do what I needed to do for the mm-hmm. accounting or. That's right. 
but I couldn't go work on houses while I was holding a baton. Right. And so that's, it was like November, December of that year that she's like, Eric, I think you need to leave first. Yeah. Instead of me. I was it was like, a tough decision. It was very tough. And it, it tormented me it, it, for a long time because I was giving up not just a, a career that I love, but that was my full identity. Yeah. And the kids that you had that would have been seniors the first year you were gone yep. were your freshmen when you came in and you wanted to see those kids through. Yeah. But we realized just for our family and what we needed, as much as we loved all those kids. I had to walk away. Yeah. yeah. So in 2018, we sat down and decided a five-year plan. And our goal was to have 25 doors, so 25 units, on 16 properties by the end of 2022 to yeah. reach our cash flow goal and for both of us to be out of our jobs. Right. Um, so... Right now, we're sitting in April of 2022 as we record this, and we have 29 doors and 14 homes and one and a half times the cash flow. So our goal was 25. We have 29 doors, um, 16 properties. We have 14, but we have one and a half times the cash flow because we've chosen to pursue different strategies in shorter term rentals that generate more cash flow per property. Um, That's what we did to get where we wanted to be as fast as we needed to be there. Yeah, our, there our burst strategy kind of ran its course when, when the market started getting a little yeah. bit more pricey. We chose this strategy because our goals were to be home with our kids. There's this thing called the PETA factor. It's the pain in the butt factor. But change butt for a different word. Yeah, no, um, I got it. I yeah. got it. So with renting the way we do, we have more work involved. And eventually we want to have all these homes converted to just standard 12-month leases with a property manager. So Mm -hmm. we're not having to spend as much time. But for our goals and what we had in our toolbox, we were fine pursuing this strategy Mm -hmm. to get the cash flow. Um, So I guess all of that to say, our clear vision and our big why gave us what we needed to do to reach our goal. And I don't think if if we started this without goals, we would have never achieved everything we achieved. Yeah. If you don't know where you're headed, you'll end up someplace completely different than yeah. where you wanted to be. Right. And if you have no idea where you're headed, you're going to end up somewhere that's probably useless. Yeah. So I guess talk a little bit about the market today and what you're seeing. I know well, we've talked about it some. But. Yeah. So it's hard to buy an investment property on the market that you can add a lot of value to and pay a discount price. Now, there are creative ways to find houses that are not on the market that we do not do. We've done it a little bit in the past, but we're not, you know, big into knocking on doors, into doing mailers, and to having bandit sides on the side of the road, or even doing, you know, SEO marketing for people that want to sell, but not with a realtor. So there are ways to to buy houses that you can burr, but it takes a lot of front-end work. That is something that we are not investing ourselves in. So we wanted to just change our strategy. So instead of buying Burr properties, we bought short-term rental style houses. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, these are not Airbnb style houses. These are quasi, semi-furnished that rent by the week. Yeah, so we, I guess we're using the best use possible. We're getting as much cash flow out of each house as we possibly can. Right, and we are, I would say, possibly paying maybe 5% below market for the houses that we're buying, 5 to 10% below market, because we are still buying houses that need work. It's just that houses that need work on the market are still going for a premium. Right, yeah. So the last house we bought, we paid about market for it and still had to work on it. Yeah, but... but our strategy knew, would work on it. It Our strategy worked because we're using it to the maximum use possible. Yes. And because we have experience in a relationship with our private money lender... He funded 100% of the purchase. Right. And we just had to pay for the renovations out of pocket. So some of that is on our credit card that we are paying interest on, which is not our ideal situation, but we're, we're paying that down. But that cost was worth it for the 10-year play. Right. And I think that's the, the situation in this market right now. You can't focus on just what one year, year one, two, and three looks like. You have to look at the big picture to see yeah. what's the long play. Because one, two, three... The next few years could look very interesting because there's going to be some kind of a correction. Might not be in every market, might not even be in our market, but there's something brewing. Everyone knows there's something brewing. We just don't know what that is yet. 
and you're going to hear it all over YouTube and TikTok and wherever you get your secondhand media, you're going to hear other people talking about what they predict. You know, Kiyosaki has predicted a, a crash three different times right. in the past seven years, but other people are saying there's not a crash coming. Yeah. So I, I think it's one of those things that, you know, prepare for the worst and, and hope for the best right. and just do what you're good at and stick to your guns Yeah. and do what works for you. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, that is all we have about our story. Um, so next week we're going to do a, a deep dive on a lesson. And then the week after we'll talk about how we, I guess, didn't apply in this situation. Right. So be on the lookout for the next episodes. We'll be producing weekly again. So we look forward to chatting with you again soon. So thanks y'all for hanging out with us and listening to us talk about our story and how we got started. What lessons can you take from our experience and apply to your life? Don't let the time you just invested go to waste. You only get one life, so live it purposely. That's all we have for you today. See you next time. Are you ready to discover and build your dream life? Then it's time to become a Pathfinder. Head over to OnPurposeInvestor.com and sign up for our newsletter to get tips and tricks to help you find your path and get the latest from our blog. If you haven't already, we'd really appreciate an honest review on your favorite podcast app. If you're enjoying this show, share it with friends, family, and fellow investors. See you next time at the On Purpose Investor Podcast.